Hello, my beautiful co-creators. Lilu here. I'm in Brussels today, and uh, we're going to speak of the ocean because there, it's it's something we just discussed it actually in French. And I'm here with Claire, that is a journalist, and you have done many documentaries on this topic. And then one day you decided to change, you know, your life and 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 not fight, but uh, put a, a very important topic that really appeared to you as a as a, as, as something totally. Uh, crazy surreal uh, tell us about this we're going to speak actually of uh, deep sea fishing how do you call it yeah deep sea bottom fishing deep sea bottom trawling um we're definitely going to talk about this uh, very destructive fishing method um because basically we've overfished um accessible fish you know that were living in shallow waters and As a result, fisheries have gone deeper and deeper to look for new types of fish, you know, further ashore and then deeper into the ocean for new weird animals that don't really even taste that good. So it's it's highly problematic, not just for the environment, because of course, the deeper you go and the less light there is. Actually, it's pretty dark below 200 meters of depth. And therefore, there is no you know, photosynthesis, so there's no plant life, so there's no food available for animals. So the only food that they can actually get is the stuff that falls from the surface. And so everything is really in the slow lane, you know, animals move slowly, they live for a long time, sometimes over a hundred years. They look strange. They look very weird. <laughs> And... And they just, you know, they reproduce late in life and they have very few young, you know. So everything is just really slow and it's dark and it's cold. And um, you can just imagine that in this really kind of slow lane, um, you know, environment, all of a sudden, you know, you've got this huge, massive fishing gear with you know huge goes how deep um all the way down to up to 1800 or 2000 meters it's so really really deep really deep and it's just it's towed along the bottom so you've got these ground rollers which are huge you know met, met, sort of metal spheres that are dragged along the seafloor and of course they destroy everything that's in their wake and they catch everything so there is Virtually. They only want some part of it. Not all. Right. There is no selectivity, so they just grab everything and then they just toss everything, uh, you know, uh, and once they're on board, they just throw everything that they don't want. So they discard. For three main commercial species, we throw up to 144 other species. So we're really talking about the single most destructive fishing gear in the world. What for? And that's really a big question because it's not profitable. And so that's like, sorry, why would they do it? Um, it's not profitable despite being largely and heavily subsidized. So public subsidies, our money, our taxpayers' money goes into this, um, as you said, surreal. I think is a pretty good term, actually. It's, uh, it's a sort of aberration, right? And, and so why? Well, because these... We do have big industrial boats, right? And they existed and we financed them, you know, we funded their construction and they've overfished available resources and then they were left with, you know, overfished stock, stocks of fish. So they started moving away and they needed to sort of use, you know, instead of scrapping the boats and just getting rid of all these destructive fishing methods, they just had to keep them afloat. So... It's like a Ponzi scheme, you know, where you always put money into the pot and and it's the Madoff sequence, as we all know it. And if we need to make sure to, you know, make all this system a little more sustainable from not just an environmental point of view, but also an economic point of view. And the way to do it is to take the subsidies away from these really destructive fishing methods because without subsidies, they, they can't, they, I mean, they wouldn't even leave port. They wouldn't go fishing without public subsidies. So if you want to get rid of the problem, just take the subsidies away. And that's, and that's clear cut, you know? And then they have to reinvent sustainability, you know, to, have to find a deal with the ocean in order to be long-term, sustainable and respectful 
and not just of life because I don't think that that flies very well with people that actually operate industrial boats you know they just are so used to really just throwing everything overboard that I don't think but at least from an economic point of view just invent your own economic sustainability without your dependence on subsidies you know because that they're so heavily subsidized that it really doesn't make sense So they're a drain on society. And right now, the European Commission in Brussels has offered to basically create a regulation which uh, ensures that we manage these really vulnerable deep sea stocks in a sustainable manner. So there's a set of measures that you know the Commission is offering member states of the um, European Union to follow. And one of those measures which is the you know the most radical way of actually getting rid of the economic problems and the environmental problems is to eliminate destructive fishing gear. And so they've offered to get rid of deep sea bottom trawling. And that creates a huge mobilization on the industrial fishing lobbies. And unfortunately, citizens are not even aware, you know, that what they eat on their plate comes from these deep sea bottom fishing techniques so we don't have the same mobilization on one side with the citizens and on the others with the lobbies and that's why you are so critical and even instrumental in getting the message out there and what are the countries i mean france compared to united states japan all of those i mean where are the most active countries there Uh, so the United States are not at all involved in deep sea fishing. Um, Japan is involved and France. So there's about 10 fishing nations, which, you know, are the most active worldwide. Um, and France is, um, is basically poised as the seventh. We're always, you know, like the seventh fishing nation for deep sea animals only. Um, so we have a pr very important role, especially in Europe, where, re although it doesn't really, when you look at it, because, I mean, deep sea catches only are about, you know, 1% of the French deep sea catch, for example, or the global European deep sea catch only equates to about 1% of the global fish catch in the EU. So it's residual from, you know, an economic point of view. It doesn't create that many jobs or whatsoever. And so it's not really that important from an economic point of view at all. Uh, and in France, we have less than 10 boats. Yeah, but here we're talking really of, and that's why we're having this conversation, of paradigm shift, huh? of creating a new world of, of, of those old structures kind of need to just crumble. Right, yeah, it's just like, do we Does want... It make sense. Yeah, it doesn't make <laughs> sense. It's, but actually, it's really just like agriculture, you know? I mean, what, what kind of... Do we want to reinvent our relationship to the planet so that we can actually be sustainable. And this is no tree hugger position, right? I mean, whether you like nature or hate it, even if you hate being in the countryside, you can't stand the sound of birds, you know, still you have to depend on nature for food production. And of course, fishing is the last activity where we just go pick things. We don't have to, we don't sow seeds in the oceans of fish, you know, so it's not like agriculture, right? It's a, you just, depend on wild resources so you've got to make sure that you leave them alone so that they can actually reproduce you know that's the only thing that you really require and and agriculture fisheries same it's the same ordeal you know you've got to invent a way to throw less chemicals in nature to get the maximum benefits from nature and the same you know human and the best maximum human yield So you want the maximum amount of jobs for the most respectful, you know, production means that you can invent um, with the biggest turnout, turnout, you know, of uh, food production. So, and you've got to find the right balance and industrial, the industrial scale, whether it be agriculture or fishing just doesn't work. And they want you to believe that, but it's not true. And when you look at um, organic farming, It actually, because you don't throw pesticides and you don't throw chemicals and antibiotics whatsoever, you actually, the food production of organic farming is actually less, you know, expensive than traditional chemical farming. The only thing is that the distribution schemes are not in place yet. So we end up actually paying, you know, more for organic farming if you live in a city but if you can organize you know the basket or whatever for you're going to pay less money for the best possible food and it's going to have the best impact on the farmers and so on 
fishing fishing is just the same way mm. i saw on your website because i know you you have created this association bloom and there is a part in french and then there's hong kong why hong kong so there's an english too and there's something happening there right we have an office in hong kong because we specialize on sharks um because sharks are huge predators as we all know because we know them from jaws you know <laughs> and they're spooky and all of that and Um, but they are actually um, heavily fished, and that's and a lot of it is for shark fin soup. Um, and therefore, we created an office in Hong Kong to really address this specific problem, and we've managed to turn out some really good success. But um, so it's an ongoing process, of course, to really shift mm -hmm. consumption habits and you know awareness about shark fin issues. Um, and that's what that's all we do in Hong Kong, really. It's, there's so much to do on sharks. Yeah. How how can we support you? Um, well, definitely, we need to spread the word about um, what's happening in the EU right now because it's going to be such an impactful piece of regulation if we manage to eliminate the most destructive fishing gear in the world. That means that maybe we're smart enough as a group of humans to actually decide what kind of future we want on the planet. And um, and we need to be the voice of the fish, really. So that's what I think we need to support NGOs in general. And I'm not really talking about just our, you know, our NGO. And of course, if you're rich, it's great to give a lot of money. But even if you're not, then for 10 euros a, a year, you can actually support us and give us your you know, email address so that we can actually mobilize you to sign petitions, to spread the buzz and to let you know how this is going. Yeah. I, f I feel it's, uh, it's not even giving a voice to the fish. It's, it's really honoring our citizenship and being on Earth for planet Earth. I mean, this is really, it's like, why is this going on? Why is this happening? Let's take responsibility. Maybe we're not directly in contact with the ocean world or realizing the impact of it, but let's let's stand out for this aberration because, you know, and, and, and let's uh, let's take position and support because as you said, the more people, then I guess this piece can kind of be removed from this pyramid <laughs> and then the whole thing collapse. So there is a really an economical political impact. For sure. And also to be honest, as a, this is more of a personal statement, but Um, you know, working on this, I, I'm really a deep sea freak. Like I know a lot about the deep sea and everything. And and from that deep sea expertise, I was drawn into, you know, taking action on a sort of institutional level here in Brussels with the parliament and the council and, and whatnot. Um, but then I've realized in this process how it works, like how politics work and how pieces of legislation are actually voted and I've discovered the power and the presence of uh, industrial lobbies. And at first, and of course, my motivation remains the protection of the biggest habitat on the planet and trying to find a deal for the just the best outcome for humans as well, right? Not just for fish whatsoever. But also, to be honest, my big motivation now is really that I don't think it's right the way things work. I, I just and now it's really just about fighting the injustice of having these lobbies just because they have money and power they have such an impact on regulations so they basically write the regulations they want for themselves and that's not how it should be because it, it's it's good for them it's not good for us you know so I think it's it's become a broader stand you know my my position has has changed on this and now you really could mobilize me on just about any kind of fight now that I've seen so close how it works. I've lost a lot of uh, naivety, I think, you know, in the process, but um, but definitely I, I think it's it's more, yeah, a justice for, it's a fight for justice. And it is a fight. I mean, I didn't like that terminology. I wish I could stay away from it, but we have to be real. If you want to invent sustainability and to have this deal, like peaceful deal with the planet, it's a fight to protect the planet right now. It's a fight, you know, it's, it's, crazy how lonely you are and there are people out there and I hope that they hear our call you know but still you know it's it's lobbies are a lot more mobilized than we are because they have stakes they have vested interests and for us it's more like a long-term thing like if we have a cancer at some point we're going to ask where does my cancer come from and at that stage we're going to you know question the world around us and what we've thrown in it and what we've ingested as a result 
But until you're really sick or your children are sick, you don't really ask yourself that question, right? And therefore, there's just this timeline, which is different. They have a direct vested interest, so they're super mobilized. And we try to tell the world, please help us, you know. But people go, oh, okay, you know, oh, great, mm, interesting. And then they turn off their TV and then they go and just have fish, you know. <laughs> and what do they care, you know. So that's why we, do, we need to, to empower NGOs, really. Mm. That's all we can do for you. Just try to be out there and fight for this. Beautiful. I'm very happy to spread this, my beautiful co-creators. Thank you for listening and sharing this video. Thank you, Claire. Thank you. It was very nice meeting you. And thank you, Lino. Much, much love. Blessings to you. And uh, please do whatever your intuition tells you to do here. Follow your heart. Thank you, my beautiful co-creators. We're definitely creating a new world, a new paradigm. It's happening. I can see it. It's happening in Belgium. It's happening all around the world. I just love to travel and collect and spread all those amazing stories because it's it's definitely happening and it's in our hands it's in your hand big kiss bye bye <laughs>